Hello, everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, open the anticipatory innovation governance towards proactive governance. I'm Katja Holger from the Finnish Ministry of Finance. And uh, I would uh, welcome you all very much. And also in, here in the very beginning, I would also already like to thank the OECD, the European Commission and the OPSI for, the, for this event. And uh, like many of you, we are also working in Finland with these issues on anticipatory innovative governance, and we are doing it in close partnership with the OECD. But wh why is this important? We know that um, the need for governments to respond to emerging challenges is particularly acute at the moment. But we also know that besides the pandemic we are in at the moment, there are other widespread events connected to climate change, migration, and also other quickly developing issues that are emerging. And we can see actually in our environment, uh, in our environment, the complex systems and the problems they contain uh, have become perhaps more the norm rather than the exception. And however, we still seem to be maybe on a reactive mode. We look at the future issues and maybe we do also some future work but then we put those aside as they are often still a separate exercise and we start waiting for something to happen that needs us to react. I, of course, I a little bit exaggerate here, but maybe not too much. So it is, of course, excellent that our governments have been good in reacting quickly and efficiently, but the reactive approach to setting policy is proving increasingly uh, inadequate. So what if we could be proactive so that we would not need to wait for a crisis to strike, but could actually anticipate and respond innovatively before the issues have emerged? We need in our governments both the ability to respond to unforeseen challenges in an expedient manner to adapt, but also to anticipate different futures and to prepare for these realities. What does this then mean? We have innovation, we have strategic insight in our governments, but we would need to build a system that helps policymakers learn from both of these approaches. But also we would need the ability to test innovations on the ground and to ensure that citizens have a voice and that we partner with the civil society, with businesses and others throughout our policy cycles. And to finish, I would go back to the why. From the point of view of, of strengthening trust and democracy, these are crucial questions for our societies and governments uh, at the moment and always. The point is that if we can be proactive instead of reactive, this is very important to these both questions. So we need anticipatory innovation governance so that it also contributes to the strengthening of citizens' trust towards government but I also want to emphasize that it's also vice versa. Anticipatory innovation governance can also strengthen the trust of government towards its citizens. And coming back to what I said earlier, that the growing pressures of democratic change, economic and social consequences of the global pandemic, climate change and evolving dynamics of the digital environment, they are also questions where trust and anticipatory governance are vital for our society. And that is why in Finland, we are working with these issues with the OECD very actively at the moment. So I want once more to welcome you all. And I also want to specifically thank Piret, Angela, Joshua and the, and the whole team for this event, but also for the, for the important work we are doing together with you. And I would now hand the floor over to Piret. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katja. As uh, Katja was also saying that uh, Finland is one of our leading countries in terms of building an anticipatory innovation governance model. We are working in Finland uh, from last year till uh, 2022 uh, with the goal and with the help of the European Commission to actually build up a functioning, practical and implementable anticipatory innovation governance system uh, that we can also use as a blueprint elsewhere. So we are doing a very great experimental work in the country and have actually reached a kind of a preliminary analysis in the country as well. So really we want to reach a proactive states within uh, anticipatory innovation governance. 
uh, we have a great team at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation working uh, on this topic. And uh, Angela Hansen, Jos Bolshar, uh, Heather Bisman, and Chiara Pagenweger will guide you through the events of today and tomorrow as well. We will be recording the main session of the events, so you will see so as well that uh, the recording is on. Um, but uh, the breakout rooms or the discussions you will have in groups will not be recorded and will be considered Shadow House rules. And today we really are asking uh, how to build an anticipatory innovation governance system. What does it take? What does it take based on countries' own experience on the ground? Uh, tomorrow the sessions will go into uh, what actually the future of the public sector holds. What is the future of the public sector? So tomorrow morning, we'll start with very core questions around that. And following up, we'll actually look into the tools and methods of anticipation. Uh, what kind of approaches we can use to anticipate and uh, uh, look at the future in more proactive ways. And here at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, we are really linking the act of anticipation, and really creating the knowledge and contextual uh, kind of scenarios about the future and preferable and pro uh, possible scenarios to also innovation. So really bridging the impact gap of foresight and futures. So really trying to make the knowledge usable on the ground. And at the Observatory Public Sector Innovation, we look at innovation in a strategic manner from very highly directed or undirected, uh, certain or uncertain ways. So our innovation portfolios that we analyze and build in countries involve mission-oriented innovation, enhancement of the system, adaptive action and resilience, but also anticipatory innovation, looking at uncertain, um, uncertainty. So really, uh, while we're building systems to last, we shouldn't really uh, forget to anticipate that our current understanding may not fit the view of the future or what is actually upcoming. So we also need to update our governance systems to make it work better. And for that, we actually need uh, anticipation and also innovation so that this kind of futures and foresight knowledge doesn't remain in silos that actually gets used. So the most important uh, factor of anticipation is that it uh, leads to action of today. So we're not thinking about, for thinking's sake, about what will happen in 2030 or 2050, know that we actually start to take steps towards those preferable uh, futures that we want to see happening, or we also take steps to avoid uh, scenarios that we don't want to see happening. And by doing so, governments uh, can give really big signals into which way to go and which way to act. And governments need to really think about the ways of doing that. And we, in the, at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, really look at the agency of uh, government officials and their partners to uh, anticipate and innovate based on that. So what kind of tools and methods, uh, data and measurement they have available, what kind of sense-making processes are actively used in governments, what kind of organizational capacity and alternative exploration is in place. But also we look at the authorizing environment that usually gets uh, kind of forgotten that we need actually to someone to say that this work is valuable and legitimate and needed that the feedback system from senior leaders in government and elsewhere in your organizations are in place to also say this is worth uh, worth doing this is work that is needed and leads into practical applications so countering in that as well vested interests cognitive biases having evaluation that fits anticipatory innovation in place, learning loops and partnerships that really build on top of the knowledge. And really to this to also to counter the really the, in the innovation fields known the innovators dilemma that going from established practice to new and paradigmatic changes is really rife with also organizational challenges of having uh, countering strategic intent and uh, current or today's user focus that actually can hurt you in terms of thinking about the future and have uh, very diminishing uh, effects in your system, also for governments who can uh, kind of uh, lose relevance if they don't actually innovate based on future upcoming challenges. And this is also, I think, uh, really seen in the context of COVID where governments have to react faster and in more complex situations than ever and need to actually deal with new types of challenges uh, in its entirety.
But not all governments also have to deal with technology and the kind of the dilemma of being in a double blind position that uh, you have to, when it's possible to control technological development, uh, then it's very early stages and we have very little evidence. Uh, while, while we have evidence later in technological adoption, then the, really the ability to control these developments is not there anymore. So how to act in a blind situation where governments do not have uh, the, all the evidence on the table that we actually become proactive rather than uh, trying to do end of the pipe solutions that are not that uh, beneficial. Uh, we at the OECD have given some insights already about this in the uh, anticipatory innovation governance uh, brief and also in a working paper that we recently uh, came out. But most of the work is actually coming from our action research, where we're trying to build this system worldwide and looking into cases worldwide on how to do anticipatory innovation and taking these processes further. We will be also discussing some of these cases throughout today and tomorrow. But I think it's all from me at the moment, and I'm going to give it over to Heather from our team to actually uh, go and make a kind of an anticipatory innovation map with everybody here. I also forgot to mention that uh, if you have questions, comments, reactions, then please add them to the chat and the team will try to get the, to these as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, if you want to introduce yourself, then now it is the opportunity to do so. Heather, I'll give it over to you. Thanks, Perez. So I'm seeing in the chat, we have participants from all over the world and that's great to see. Um, in order to get a visual idea of where you are all joining from, uh, my colleague Angela will be posting a link in the chat to this Padlet. And what we're asking you to do is just to add your location on the map. And you can do that by click, clicking this uh, plus button in the corner. And you can either search your location in this search box. So I'll search uh, Paris, for instance. Or you can pin your location onto the map. And once you find your location, I invite you just to add in uh, your organization name, or if you're comfortable, both your own name and your organization name here. So I'm going to throw in OECD Heather Huseman. And this way we can get a bit of a, a visualization of who's with us today and where you're all joining us from. So if you can take just a moment now to do that, and I will refresh it and see if we can get a, an idea of where you're all joining from. So lots from around Europe. Oh, wow. Okay. Some from Chile, it looks like, Uruguay, Spain, North America, even Malaysia. Great representation. So if you haven't had a chance to add to the map, feel free to add your location in on the map throughout uh, and we can continue on in the meantime. Thank you so much, Heather. It's great to see that the um, anticipatory innovation uh, has interest worldwide. So we were also quite surprised about the interest in the, in the workshop that we have at the moment as well. But without further ado, we're actually going to hear from countries themselves about uh, uh, why they're interested in this, uh, what, why this is worthwhile, and how they are actually building anticipatory innovation governance systems in their home countries. And first of all, we're going to hear from Finland and Ireland, who are also uh, partners of the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation at the OECD. And in both countries, we have been working together to actually set up those structures. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give uh, the floor to Sirpa Kekkonen, who is a senior advisor in the Finnish Prime Minister's office since already 2003. And she also currently helps to coordinate OECD's work on the anticipatory innovation government project for the Prime Minister's office and the Ministry of Finance in Finland. Uh, she has been the previous head of government strategy secretariat. Uh, she has been the really the leading force uh, behind actually uh, developing a strategic approach for the government of Finland in its entirety. And uh, also a 
great friend and a supporter of anticipation. Uh, tell us a little about why uh, this work is important and uh, what kind of challenges you're facing in Finland uh, actually putting this approach in place. <clears throat> thank you very much, Pirit. Uh, and uh, thank you also for your kind words. Um, yes, I have committed myself to say a couple of words uh, on the state of the art of anticipatory innovation system in Finland. And then I'm going to uh, take up a couple of uh, kind of uh, observations that we have made so far in, in, the, in, the, in the job that we're doing with the OECD and, and all together. But uh, first, first one has to note that in Finland uh, we are at the very early stage of taking steps towards a proper system of anticipatory, anticipatory innovation. Mm, this said, uh, we are optimistic uh, that in Finland we will be able to build a new model of governance on what we have worked on so far to stimulate uh, our policy making for future needs. <clears throat> we have great expectations on the cooperation with the OECD and international governance community in this journey. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, common target in, uh, in the project that Piret was referring to is not, le non not less than, than uh, to build a model <laughs> for anticipatory innovation. Uh, and we are we have started the, the journey and we're going on with that. Um, the most, most important building blocks in, in our case, in Finland, are the changes we have implemented in our system of strategic planning, uh, particularly uh, the move to strategic government program system, uh, which uh, was uh, <coughs> implemented first time in 2015. Um, Government program uh, that is, you know, the strategic going into the strategic government program can be con considered as the previous big systemic change in Finland. Other steps we can profit of uh, in our work uh, are, for instance, uh, our experiences on experimentation, uh, setting up experimentation uh, uh, <clears throat> culture, enabling legislation the wide work in the field of digitalization uh, in Finland and adopting so-called ecosystemic approaches in many fields. In terms of the four innovation models uh, the OECD has developed and which uh, uh, Piret sh showed, showed on a slide, the ones where we have in Finland already more experience uh, with are the enhancing uh, innovation, mission-oriented, innovation and even adaptive innovation uh, but the next ambition is the anticipatory innovation system which we hope will be built as an important next step into the strengthened strategic policy making system that we have been working on during recent years despite progress made into this direction we are still lacking for instance an inbuilt connection of quite intensive foresight work that we have as such, but to connect it with the actual decision making, political uh, decision making and political process as an integral part of it. Uh, taken the big challenges uh, the societies undergo at the moment and more so in the future, uh, the need for stronger innovation in the public sector is clear. But not only innovating to improve the present administrative in institutions and processes, but ever more innovating for the future. As the future is uncertain, like uh, Piret was, was uh, pointing out, it's a million dollar question, how? How to innovate for the future? I, I, I don't have an answer here, but we will examine this together with the OECD and with the international community, governance community. But anyhow, there are big questions remaining. What do we need? What needs to be changed 
before we can talk about a real anticipatory innovation system, not only fragment, fragments of it. First of all, uh, I think and we think that we have to widen the understanding of the urgency to make changes in our governance system in order to meet the challenge of rapid and thorough transformations in our societies. Uh, a, a particular concern uh, in my mind is how to motivate and bring in political decision makers into this discussion and these discussions. As we're talking about issues uh, in wide social context and, wide, and with wide social consequences, for any change it is necessary that politicians are behind uh, changes and they are with uh, they are with us we we need to identify and uh, and uh, create new elements into our governance not only fine tune tune uh, old uh, old processes uh, we need new elements that entrust us better for the public sector's specific uh, responsibility as guardian of the democratic base of our societies. My dear colleague Kati was also referring to this, that deep, when we dig deeper into what we are doing, it's really not less than a question of, of democracy and its future. So what would these new elements uh, be? that we need. The OECD speaks about new structures and, and mechanisms. Will these be organizational and institutional changes? New type of planning and decision-making processes? Bringing in completely new actors? Uh, new mindsets? And so on. Many open questions. Uh, what is identified already now from the work we have started is that it's not only a question of inwards directing, directing systemic changes within the public sector, but the role of the public administration vis-à-vis -vis the society as a whole. Maybe the biggest changes needed will, be, will relate, relate to the openness of public actions, and involving citizens and other stakeholders in policy making in a proactive role. In other words, moving uh, in real life to co-creation and co-design approaches, not just talking about them. As public sector role remains the stewardship of social so, so, societal uh, changes in a way that guarantees the shared and common interests and inclusiveness of the society as a whole. With these words, I'm happy to say that I'm. this is a great event and very much looking forward to, to, uh, to discussions today and tomorrow. Thank you, Piret and others. Thank you, Sirpa. Uh, it is great to have Finland on board. Uh, you have one of the most advanced uh, uh, foresight systems and also strategic planning systems in the world, I would say, from the OECD's perspective. And it's great to actually see them merging uh, together. Uh, I'm going to go to Chris O'Regan from Ireland next, who is also embarking kind of on a systems journey of actually building it up in government. Uh, Chris is an assistant principal officer uh, at, as part of the Our Public Service 2020 team and the Program Management Office in Public Service Reform in Ireland. Uh, she's also a great member of the OECD Public Governance Committee Bureau and uh, a fundamental support of uh, kind of governance renewal and modernization around OECD countries. Uh, Grace, can you give us a little bit of an overview about uh, uh, what are the kind of the current steps in building up a kind of strategic foresight in the Irish system and uh, what are your plans for anticipation? Yeah, thanks, Brett, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And um, uh, like that, we have been working with Pratt and the OECD um, and um, are very much at the start of the journey in, in introducing strategic foresight in a systematic way into the policymaking process in, in Ireland. And 
I'm very interested to hear Serpa's uh, presentation too, because we've been studying your approach in Finland and as part of we very much see you as, as one of the, the global leaders in this. Um, but just to take you back a little bit to, to where this journey started for Ireland, um, as, as Prash was saying, uh, I work in public service reform in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. And we uh, look after the, the public service reform strategy for the public service, our, our public service 2020. So we work with the Public Service Leadership Board, which is the heads of the main government departments and sectoral agencies. And in the midst of COVID last year, <clears throat> As we were looking at the end of the current public service reform strategy coming to coming coming we, we was finishing up last year and planning ahead to what the needs of the next public service reform strategy would be um the public service leadership board asked us to consider in the light of what was happening with covid when you think back we'd only recently in the last decade come out of the financial crisis we were in the midst of the covid crisis and as we looked to the future we could see the the climate crisis coming down the tracks um, what would we as a system need to be doing in order to um, to be able to to respond to the challenges of the future in terms of how would our policymakers be able to anticipate and uh, be proactive in terms of the decisions we would be taking policy decisions we would be taking today um, that that would that would have an impact on on, on outcomes tomorrow and the the, the, the sort of the driving um, rationale for taking this approach was in developing our new public service reform plan we wanted to try and anticipate what the challenges are going to be over the next 10 years and the question we were asking ourselves was how can our public service be fit for purpose out to 2030 and beyond what would the mega trends be that we would have to take account of how would uh, those mega trends be impacting different parts of uh, the, the public service and the, the different sectors things like climate crisis, biodiversity loss, growing population migration, what would all these megatrends mean in each of our, you know, sexual areas? Um, and obviously good policymakers would always take account of future trends and would always factor, uh, you know, the, the future is, is key in developing policy. Um, but was there a need to dig deeper and was strategic foresight something that would help us to interpret the signals and help us to um, to take the necessary longer term perspective in, in making policy decisions today. So as a result of the decision of Public Service Leadership Board that we would take this approach um, or we would explore this approach, we, we, we uh, were very happy to start working with Paresh and the team at Opsi um, from last September and the, the approach we took to it and again, I suppose the starting point was, you know, where are we at? There's, there's pockets of strategic foresight we knew happening across the Irish uh, public service and, and policy making. There's some very good examples. Um, but yet we need to understand to what extent is this being, are these tools being used across the board? So Paret and Joshua and the team worked with the team that we gathered. We, we identified key senior policymakers um, from across government departments in the wider public sector to work with us to help us identify what currently was happening and to work through you know what what are the strategic foresight tools what are the mega trends of most um, to, to basically we went on a journey with with OPSI in terms of exploring um, you know the, the options the models we, we we were very lucky to have someone from Finland come and speak to us about the system there and um, we, we engaged with um, best practice elsewhere from Singapore, from the Netherlands, and all the while considering, okay, what, what does this mean for our governance structures? What does this mean? The kind of issues uh, that have been raised already about um, the type of, I suppose, um, you know, the demand for, for strategic foresight. Um, the, 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 there's, there's, there's producers of it, there's users of it. Um, so, We've been working with the OECD over the course of the last number of months and actually only this morning um, Pret and Josh were presenting to our one of our senior leadership groups um, on the findings of, of the report. Um, linked to this then, um, the European Commission were mentioned earlier about CATU, we applied to the Commission under their technical support instrument funding and have received um, funding to, to develop a strategic foresight action plan and as part of that to develop capacity building across across the public service. Um, the plan is that we will we will um, 
uh, undertake this within structures that have already been set up under our Public Service 2020. And basically that gives us the governance. So we have the Public Service Leadership Board um, we operate, we developed in one of the, the, the initiatives we, we uh, undertook as part of the existing public service reform plan is we developed public service innovation strategy, but the OECD also um, had, had uh, a role in, in that at, at, at the outset. Um, but we work collaboratively with teams of experts from across the public service in developing um, you know, new ideas and collaboratively working up a model, in this case, the public, the public service innovation strategy, our approach would be similar with um, strategic foresight. So basically we have the system, the governance system, we have the outreach, we, we're, we're plugging uh, the, this um, uh, initiative on, on strategic foresight into that overall governance system that, 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 that newly exists. Um, and through that, then we're going to be working um, again with the OECD um, for the next 18 months. Um, and the action plan that will be developed will, 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 will draw on the learnings of the work that we've done to date, which identifies that while there is some very good practice, there are gaps, there, there is a need to develop a systematic approach to um, developing capacity and, uh, you know, linking the, the, the strategic policy making element into the wider policy making process. One of the first um, uh, messages that the OECD gave us at so the first meeting we had with them in September was, you know, you can have the best strategic, force, strategic foresight system in the world, but if it's not uh, linked into the policy making system, um, if, if the insights aren't going to be picked up on and acted on through policy and implemented, um, it, it, it's not going to be relevant. So the, the approach we're taking with this is, uh, on the one hand, we're developing strategic foresight um, systems and capacity or link them into our governance structures. But in tandem with that, a, a separate project that's also been funded through the, the European Commission, TSI, is looking at the wider policy development system and taking, you know, very good policy uh, exists and practices exist in Ireland, but to ensure that strategic foresight element of it is again kind of plugged into the relevant systems. Um, there is still going to be working uh, with colleagues of ours in, in the Taoiseach's department, our Prime Minister's department, who are looking at this wider policy development um, project to ensure that the strategic foresight uh, element of the work that we're doing is going to be relevant in the wider policy making system. And then through our governance structures, with the support of the top management in our public service, and then broken down through these different groups of, of experts that it'll be reinforced. Um, at, our, at our meeting this morning, um, uh, colleagues were talking about the importance of um, using strategic foresight in the wider strategic uh, policy making um, environment. Uh, our government um, recently approved uh, that, that we would be developing a wellbeing framework. It's work, it's just starting. Um, colleagues are mentioning the importance of linking strategic foresight into that. Um, that in order for it to be of greatest use, it needs to be um, informing the, the wider strategic policy making um, uh, environment and the, the systems that are that are already in in place. So, like that, we're very interested in the the the, the, the system in Finland where there's um, engagement with the political system and experts and policymakers and broader discussions with, um, with, with the civic community. We, we haven't reached the point yet of deciding how far we can go with this. Um, at the moment, it's, it's within the public, the public service reform agenda, but the, be the benefit of that is we have reached across the whole public service. So for example, um, in the departments responsible for climate action, you know, we we're also looking at um, uh, public service capacity more broadly in looking at say at the, the, the challenges of, of, of climate action we can ask ourselves in terms of you know public policy maker skill public policy and um, makers skills and civil servant skills what kind of additional skills do we need to be planning for in 10 years into the future that will be required in order for policymakers and public officials to deliver in their work, whether they're working in the area of climate or they're working in whatever, whatever sector that they might happen to be working in, that it's helping us take decisions today, considering the longer term and giving civil servants and policymakers the skills to address those, those issues into the future that uh, we can start to, 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 to plan for today. 
So as I say, we're at very much at the beginning of the road and the, the, the great value for us in working with the OECD and you know, listening to the experiences of countries that have are further down the road, have developed different means of, of addressing these issues um, is, is invaluable to us. So we're very happy to um, partake in, in this workshop and are very interested to, um, to, to understand other, other countries' experiences. Um, and as, as we were saying at our own internal senior meeting this morning, this, we view this as a very important and significant piece of work um, that is going to be a public, the key plank of our, our next public service reform plan and is going to have an impact in, in how policy is made, um, particularly in terms of uh, incorporating that longer term view and being proactive. So that's it. With any questions, I'm very happy to, to take them. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, it is always a pleasure to work with the Irish and the Finnish because uh, I have uh, yet to see in a kind of when they make up their mind to actually do it, which is a fantastic kind of partner for an international organization to also test out new ideas with. Uh, so a pleasure to work with you both. But maybe a quick question or one question before we send people off to breakout rooms to dig down into actually how to build a system. Uh, is for the both of you is what is the next big step or concrete step that you're going to take uh, to actually make that system an actuality in your uh, own systems? Uh, Sirpa, maybe we can start with you. Uh, what is the next big thing or next concrete thing that you think needs to happen in Finland to actually um, kind of step towards an anticipatory innovation system? <clears throat> As I said, uh, we are we have high expectations of of this uh, <clears throat> cooperation with with you and your unit uh, in terms of kind of uh, digging deeper into the uh, into the question of what elements are missing and what elements should we kind of uh, uh, strengthen in our in our system. Um, I think that uh, we have to raise. Uh, Awareness and 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 widen 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 the uh, the the uh, the uh, peop the uh, circles of people who 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 are who are talking about these these things. Maybe of course we governance people we we look at it from from a certain perspective, and I think that what will be very important step in in uh, in Finland is that if the plans to continue this uh, eu funded project in finland uh, will continue and 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 cover also some cases on specific policy areas where we could test uh, you know the the elements of of the of the new model or modeling uh, I, I think that is this is a long way this is how we see it that it's a, it's a long journey so we can't kind of expect uh, one report on, or one one uh, project to bring all the all the uh, answers, but I think that through those case studies that we will, I hope, we will be able to conduct uh, in 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 really like they go more like to substance. So I think that that's one way of kind of broadening the uh, the, the 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 people who who are who are involved. So I would say that 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 is the next step concretely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we are very much praised as well to run this kind of demonstration case and experiments actually in the Finnish government from actually doing anticipatory innovation as well. Maybe, Grace, uh, what are your next steps and how are you going to build up the kind of producers and suppliers of anticipatory knowledge and foresight knowledge in the government? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think we've got an 18 month um, time frame from the time um, we move on to the next phase of the project, which is developing the program and uh, we've identified already the, the various um, uh, the, the, the people we need to target in terms of the capacity building and we've linked in through to the, the again the various mechanisms for um, delivering the capacity building so over the next 18 months we're going to be um, developing uh, um, the, the this is a program for it's going to be delivered the capacity building is going to be um, uh, run out to all the, the, the key producers and the, the users of strategic foresight and there's going to be um, uh, strategic foresight literacy training delivered at, at particularly the most senior levels 
and because we're working with the Public Service Leadership Board and um, that, that is public service um, leaders on it, but separately there's the Civil Service Management Board, which is all at the top level of the civil service. They're also very interested in this project. So we'll be reporting into each of those key leadership bodies within the civil and public service. And with their support, um, generating the awareness and the capacity building, it, 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 the then move is, is to put it into practice. Um, and the, the fact that similarly, the, the, the policy development um, work, it, the, 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 the toolkit and the kind of the one system um, yeah, being there for, for all civil servants across the country to use, that, that, that will become within 18 months the standard kind of toolkit for developing policy and strategic foresight will be part of that. Um, at the, the, the end of the 18 months, the, 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 the last deliverable within that, that piece of work they're going to be doing with you is development of a case study. Um, so if that could be done in an area, and we've, we were discussing this morning, the type of um, topic that you could choose to, to, to showcase how strategic foresight can be used to almost develop a business case for the next phase to, to try and generate awareness around the benefits of using it. Um, so yeah, where, where are all systems go in terms of um, uh, developing awareness, gen developing capacity, and then uh, with support of our top level uh, leadership groups, um, putting it into practice. Thank you so much, Grace. So. Uh, this has been fantastic. So we have really kind of you know, fantastic cases on the country level coming up on essentially anticipatory innovation systems being built in practice as we speak. But we also want to ask from you, everybody, on what kind of purposes and anticipatory innovation governance systems could be built up. So we're all going to send you uh, by yourself into breakout rooms where you can actually meet your colleagues uh, and community of uh, friends of anticipation. So soon you will be directed into breakout uh, rooms where you can discuss with your colleagues. Uh, Angela will share with the group also the link to the Padlet board that we will be using to collect insights from you. Uh, so you see the Padlet board with the question that we are posing with you as well. Uh, please copy the link from the chat into your Chrome. And we're going to ask you what purposes should governments consider in building national anticipatory systems? And why should governments anticipate? Uh, in the breakout rooms, you will have 10 minutes. Uh, on the board itself as well, you can add uh, new, uh, for new comments by pushing on the right side, uh, lower hand is a plus button. So if you click on that, then a new card will appear and you can add uh, new examples to your uh, board. So when you go to your breakout rooms, please quickly, um, and then uh, go one by one, uh, sharing your examples about uh, what to actually, uh, what kind of purposes it might be working towards. We'll see you back in 10 minutes in the main room and uh, hope uh, for great insights. I'm back to, from the comments, at least, I see that uh, um, some of the groups had quite interesting discussions. So I would have loved to be the fly on the wall to actually see the discussions themselves. And as you can see as well on the board, you can also uh, add your like uh, or love button on the heart button as well. So you can look over what other groups have been contributing and add your comments below to the area as well. We'll wait for a couple of uh, seconds for people to come online again, and uh, then we will get started uh, with the next items. Uh, next, we're actually going to talk about uh, um, radical experimentation. So not only doing about futures foresight and anticipation, but we also need to create more evidence into which directions or which kind of futures to explore. And for this, we're going to look into a couple of countries and their examples. Uh, in uh, Canada, Canada has been for quite a few years uh, on a national level, enhancing experimentation within the government and the national government and federal government level and as a directive to support that. And in Sweden, we have the COMET committee to advance the technology connected to that. So without further ado, I'm going to give it over to Nick Chesley, who is the director of strategic policy at the strategy, uh, Treasury Board Secretariat in Canada. He works uh, focuses on 
thinking about the future of the public service and he uh, also leads a team dedicated to advancing experimentation in government helping build capacity uh, in the departments on around these topics and giving getting really evidence about what works in practice before joining the government nick did his phd in behavioral economics in the university of oxford oxford uh, where he studied how policy can help people plan for the future so nick i'm going to give it over to you to tell us a little bit about uh, how to experiment in government conditions perfect and thank you very much i have promised to be quick so i will do my best but i'm relying on the oec to glare at me if i take too long um so <laughs> it's a nice intro thank you very much I'm going to talk very briefly about what my team does and then some of the key barriers we've encountered in terms of making government more experimental. To give you some context, various parts of the government of Canada, and I think a lot of governments have had some experimentation going on for many years. But about five years ago, we had a big push started to try to make our government more experimental. One of our ministers was mandated to make government more experimental. And so my team was set up to help deliver on that mandate and both build supply in terms of building capacity, building expertise, and also demand for experimentation, highlighting to senior executives why experimentation was important, why it was necessary. And as we heard earlier this morning, trying to make sure that they're asking for it and asking for experimentation and indirectly asking for uh, anticipatory experimental governance. I'm going to start with definitions, though, because this is a common question we talk about. Canada does not have the answers to how to define experimentation versus innovation versus anticipatory innovation governance. How we define it is that innovation for us is doing new things. Experimentation is the process by which you measure if things work. You're trying out new things in a rigorous way. So they overlap, they're related, but that's how we divide the world up. And I will say there's a lot of discussions in Canadian government about whether experimentation is the right word. We have some departments that refuse to use the word experimentation um, because of their context or because of the type of work they do. They feel it's either confusing or in some cases offensive. So our corrections department, for example, that runs our prisons doesn't like the concept of experimenting with prisoners, understandably. Um, and so we're very neutral on what language is used, trials, tests, research. The core for us is is something working or not? Are we measuring whether it's working and are we measuring whether it's better than what we used to do? So if you want to go to the next slide, Josh. So what do we do? I would say we do three things. We try to build capacity for experimentation. So we run a training program across government to help build capacity for experimentation, where we do a call for experts on experimentation and a call for projects who want to experiment and we pair them together. It's our experimentation works training program. And there's a, a link to our blog if you're interested in the slide. Um, so we've got about a dozen projects this year. Some of them are experimental, some of them are exploratory, um, which is what we refer to as pre-experimental work. So qualitative research or other things to set up the experiment. Um, but the goal is to both build capacity and also build examples for others to see, uh, to learn from and to follow in terms of doing experiments. We also support the experimentation community in government. So we have a community of practice. We do learning events. We're working on a course for them on how to experiment. And then we also work on systems change. Um, and that's no surprise to most of the people in the audience, I suspect. But we try to think about how do we change the system to make it easier to experiment and to increase the incentives to experiment. So we issued a directive from our deputy head equivalent for the senior public servants in our department. Um, saying you should experiment and here's why to all other deputy heads so our permanent secretary equivalent in the UK model. Um, we also do an annual survey of every department and how they're being managed. That's not specific to experimentation, but we've included experimentation questions. And so we ask every department every year, are you experimenting? And if you are, how are you using the results to inform the decisions you take? Are you improving your programs? Are you shutting down programs that don't work? What are you doing? Um, and that's sort of part of our mission to broaden or advance the maturity of departments and how they experiment and not just are they doing them, but also they using the information. And then my final slide, Josh, if you can thank you. Um, common barriers. So some of you may see some of these more than others, but I think when we think about the barriers we've seen and that we've tried to work on and some more successful than others, access, access to expertise is a big one. Do departments have the methodological expertise to run a rigorous experiment? 
but also do they have the process expertise? A lot of the questions we get are, well, how do I get this done in government? How do I convince senior leadership this experiment is important? How do I get the funding I need to run this experiment? How do I get IT to help me do an A-B test on our department's website? So sometimes it's about the methodology. Often it's more general about how do I get this through the process that is government, through the system that is government. Data is another big one. The place to start for experimentation we find is often at the point of data. It's at what can we measure, what can we know if we're improving or not. And some parts of government have good data and some parts don't, but it's a common thing that we need to do better with our data. We need to keep it more in a more organized state. We need to use it better. We need to store it better. Third is openness to failure. And this is much more of a cultural one, but it's a little scary to risk failing. And frankly, no good experiments don't have the possibility of failing because if you already know the answer, there's no point in experimenting. And so we think experiments should be done when there is a risk of failing. If there's a hundred percent chance it'll succeed, then there's no point doing the experiment. But that's sometimes a conversation we have to have with our colleagues. And I, I think the way we often frame that conversation is the status quo is risky too. If you were just doing what you've always done, that too can fail and it can fail spectacularly sometimes. And so experimentation can actually reduce risk. It can tell you what will work and what won't work so that you can minimize the chance of failure later on. Timelines is another big one. We're talking about anticipatory innovation governance today. I think one of the challenges we see with experiments is often they are most useful a year, two years in advance. It's hard when the minister calls the department and says, I want this done by tomorrow, pop. It's much easier when you have the experimental results in advance, but that means being anticipated. It means having the government to know what's coming. Um, and then my final one, it's hard to do new things. Experimentation and innovation both are often about doing new things. And in the government, precedent is powerful. It's easier to do something that's been done before. So how do you build the precedents? How do you build the case studies, the examples to show that it has been done before? So there are examples of success and you can follow them. Um, and then, so a closing thought for you, which is that I think our experience has been there's no one right path for building experimentation. We've seen some departments start really small, get a team on the ground, do small experiments. Others start big. They establish a governance structure. They have reward their senior executives for doing experiments. It's in their performance agreements. Their, their performance is assessed on it. I think what your right approach will depend on your context but it's about building the momentum for it and doing it in an anticipatory way. So doing it before it's urgent, when you have time to think through, build the examples, build the expertise. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. John. It's such a kind of, you know, but actually one of the diff most difficult uh, jobs in government as well is to actually make governments accept risks and failure as well because we are really dealing with uncertain processes here that uh, where we can't even calculate the probability patterns and that's why we experiment to actually create evidence and sometimes governments tend to ignore that there is uncertainty at all that everything can be calculated or simplified because it creates a sense of even a false security and really this is something that we want to avoid I'm going to go to Sweden next to really know uh, how to really advance kind of radical experimentation and technology development in government uh, connected to that. So I'm going to turn to John Simonsson, who is the chair of the Swedish government the Committee for Technology Innovation and Ethics, COMET Committee. If you haven't heard about this before, then please look them up because they're fantastic. Also, a government organization to advance uh, above ministries and departments to advance this type of thinking. Uh, prior to being the chair of this committee, uh, John headed the Department of Innovation Research and Financing at the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. Uh, he also has a background in software industry as an entrepreneur. And in 2020, John Simonson was also the Agile 50s list, the world's 50 most influential people revolutionizing governance. Uh, selected by the World Economic Forum and organized by a political. So without further ado, John, I'm giving over to you. Uh, how do we make this happen in government? <laughs> thank you, Pirit. And thank you also, Nick, for a very interesting presentation from Canada. I thought I would give you examples, concrete examples of activities that we and the Swedish government tried to pursue to, to walk 
on the anticipatory uh, road, so to speak. But just one word first about COMET, our committee. We can deliver continuously different types of policy proposals to the Swedish government and to better handle the rapid technology development. And the, the committee's overarching ambition is to increase the speed towards the sustainability goals, Agenda 2030, and ensure that responsibility of innovation and technology is part of that. So let me start by, by telling a, a short story about three stone cutters and, and a merchant. Uh, there was a merchant walking outside and he bumped into three stone cutters and he asked them what they were doing. And the first stone cutter said, I'm, I'm chopping stones here. Uh, uh, don't disturb me, I need to chop many stones. And he walked on to the next stone cutter and asked him what you were doing. Okay, I, I'm here to, to, to provide a living and education for my children, so I need to work. And he worked to the third stone cutter and asked him, what are you doing? I'm part of building a cathedral. And I think this is a very good story to emphasize what all the different aspects of, of anticipatory governance has to be. That you have to balance the aspects of an internal perspective agencies. You have to have an outside inside for the citizens, for the companies. But you also have to have a holistic perspective, how we work for future generations. And all these perspectives have to balance when it comes to incentives, steering mechanism, auditing, etc. So I think that is a very important picture to have in your head when you talk about this. So then let's move on to the concrete, concrete work that, that COMET is doing. Uh, and uh, COMET has developed a very simple model that we have as a basis. And you can put on that model now, Josh. So it's a model of, of three, three parts. It's about understanding what is going on. It's about testing things to, to more quickly and safely learn what is happening. And also to find new ways of changing governance and changing, changing uh, uh, policy. And everything has a lot to do with collaboration and creating capabilities, exactly what, what Nick also said. And collaboration and capabilities are, are, are as we see, the road towards anticipation. So if we look at this first step then by what we mean by understanding, uh, part of Komete is the director general of the Swedish Competition Authority and he, he gave a very interesting example. He said, okay, I'm head of the Competition Authority. What is happening right now is that different companies use algorithms that automatically set prices compared to other companies, for example, in the financial industry. Okay, how should I as, as a regulatory authority handle this? So, so we don't get the automatic mono monopolies, for example, in between companies. Then I have to have employees that interact with these companies. I have to have employees that understand what artificial intelligence is, what blockchain is. And I have to have work procedures that ensure that when I interact with specific companies, I don't neglect other companies, for example. So he has to put completely new structures and workways and knowledges in place to, to create this understanding for the rapid development. So this is very much the notion of the whole government that we have to continuously understand what is happening and we have to create safe and, and sound mechanism to create this understanding. So it has a lot to do with knowledge building. So for example, what Comet does is that we found technology briefs that Harvard Kennedy School was developing, explaining different technologies and also putting those technologies in a policy perspective. We bring those tech sheets back to Sweden, put them in a Swedish context so that politicians and civil servants can read this and understand how technology affects policy, for example. But there are also other aspects to this. Uh, many, many um, regulatory authorities, they have very large difficulties interacting with, with companies, for example. They may, might not have the money to have those types of uh, design co-workshops or whatever. So you also me, might need to put financing in place to finance this regulatory interactive activities. So we are proposed to also that in the Swedish context. So that is the first aspect to understand what is happening and create a continuous process with different aspects to understand. And strategic foresight is of course one part of this. But the next step then is to try out new things. And here the Swedish government has said that we want the whole of Sweden to be testing ground 
for new workways, new technologies, new solutions, new regulations. But how do we accomplish this? On the European level, we talk a lot about regulatory sandboxes. And we talk about that in many other countries as well, where we try to find out how new regulation works, for example. That concept doesn't really work in Sweden. The terms are very important, as Nick also said. So in Sweden, we try to use the word regulatory greenhouses. We want to create greenhouses where different actors can step in, agencies, companies, uh, civil servants, uh, civil society, and jointly do tests of new things. And it's fully transparent what is happening inside this greenhouse. You can be there for a certain amount of time, but it's also under real conditions this is done. And one thing we are doing, for example, at Comet right now is that we're putting a proposal together to more rapidly build our electric grid in Sweden. And, and to be able to do that, normally that process to build a new cable stretching in the whole Sweden takes maybe around 10 years. To be, be able to speed up that process, we think we need to bring together the four or five different agencies that work with that, the municipalities, et cetera, to do a joint experiment, to do a joint test with new workways, to speed up the permitting process, to speed up the building process, so we can enable a sustainable development. So, but that's just one example. We have also proposed the government to put out a, a strategy for uh, testing and for experimentation. And the, the government needs them to develop methodology support. How do you create testing? How do you follow up testing? How do you create incentives for testing? How do you create new auditing procedures for testing? So you need to do a lot of groundwork to get this test culture going. And that is a many year project as Sweden is just in the beginning of this, this process. But it has a lot to do with leadership. It has a lot to do with governance. It has a lot to do with steering and courage. And then if we move on to the third part then, change. Uh, I have another example, part of the Comet Committee is also the, the one of the justices of the Supreme Court. She was earlier the, the head of the Swedish Data Protection Agency and she gave an interesting example. She said, we developed a new legislation. We launched this legislation. And within one year, the whole legislation was obsolete. And that is very dangerous uh, when you develop legislation that has a lifespan of one year because you don't understand the technology development. So she, she says right now, we have to work much more stepwise with regulation, with changing policy. Maybe you should start with uh, doing developing understanding about a thing and then stepping on to setting standards, standards or, or maybe working with agreements between different actors. And finally, you do legislation. So you have to find this much more agile and stepwise approach to, to, to development. And also Comet itself, we try to work with this stepwise approach. We develop very small proposals that are easy for the government to implement. Instead of doing this very gigantic task of, of providing a 500 page report with a lot of proposals. So to develop in small iterative steps. You can turn off the slides now. <laughs> so to, to sum up then, uh, we think it's very important to work with collaborative aspects to build capabilities in the public sector. We think it's very, very important also to create the possibilities for all municipalities, all regions and all public agencies uh, to work with this. So we have also proposed that the government should put in place a new committee where all municipalities, all agencies, all regions could report regulatory problems that stops them from testing new things, that stops them from, from, from doing innovative, innovative things. So you have to create this framework and settings to have these generic aspects of, of anticipation. So that's a bit what I would like to say. It's, from us, it's very much a culture journey. It's not a cultural revolution. It's a way of stepwise developing things. It, it's a process, I would say, of, of several decades to do this. We we'll all live in a very complex uh, situations. I think the stonecutter model helps you think about different levels, how you have to balance things, but it's a long way to go and we're just in the beginning of all this. So thanks, and back to you, Pirat. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Uh, very great to hear. And also there is fantastic materials from the Comet Committee that they have developed on this work that uh, they have also translated into English and will share this in the chat as well. 
so everybody can draw upon this and uh, can learn from their experience. Uh, the third but not least, I'm going to also go to Korka Espino uh, uh, in, and he's going to tell us how from the kind of out social change and experimentation towards specific uh, goals. Uh, Gorka is an adjunct professor at the McGill University as well, in addition to being the director of the ALC, the Basque Social Innovation Lab. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at Young Foundation and the scientific director of the Work for Progress initiative powered by Laikaya Foundation. Previously, he also served as a senior advisor to the executive office of the Basque president. Uh, Gorka, I'm going to give it over to you for your insights. Uh, thank you very much, Brett. I'm really glad to be part of the conversation. Um, I, I think I have a certain slide, but if, if it's possible, yeah, to have it, yes, that, that would be great. If not, it's, it's okay. Well, very briefly, I just wanted to share the experience that we are developing in collaboration with uh, with OCD, uh, with OPSI, in the region of, uh, of Gipuzkoa, in the, in the Basque country. So what, um, and in some way we are trying to connect these uh, anticipatory governance uh, frameworks to a very specific mission on how the whole region can accelerate um, a transition towards a more uh, sustainable uh, economy. So, so we, are, we are partnering with, uh, uh, with the innovation team of the, of the regional council and, uh, and the key uh, institutions of the area, public and private to um, uh, to design this uh, this process um, the first um, thing i want to share is um, um, the distinction in, in our experience between traditional uh, foresight and uh, anticipatory innovation um, because um, in in this area and i think as in many other parts of the world um, a, a foresight or anticipation has been a uh, traditional link to uh, ex exclusively expert analysis. So how, so how can we uh, gather the intelligence and the data that will tell us uh, what are the, the problems that are going to emerge and, and how can we manage those, uh, those problems uh, or how can we prepare ourselves for managing those problems. Um, but we see that uh, um, um, wicked problems like um, um, uh, sustainability or, or fighting inequality are are much more uh, difficult uh, to tackle than than just having a group of very good experts um, uh, considering different options. So what we are experimenting with in collaboration with OPSI is how can we combine uh, traditional foresight with a portfolio approach that will incorporate a uh, very strong uh, social and, and cultural um, initiatives. So basically, if you look at the, at the graphic, um, um, obviously the, uh, we have represented in a, in a linear way, but in the, in, in the bottom part, you will see a more realistic uh, um, uh, representation of how this process we, we expect to work, more kind of um, uh, an, uh, an iteration of, uh, of different um, experiments. So uh, we are putting a lot of effort in really listening to what are the social uh, and cultural uh, dynamics that are operating uh, in this case um, in, in regarding um, a sustainability transition. And then from that analysis, combining that with a, a traditional uh, expert analysis and foresight in order to uh, build um, uh, sense-making capabilities that are um, uh, built in different uh, uh, levels of action, not only for large scale or public sector uh, initiatives, but also for community uh, um, uh, driven uh, actions for uh, regulation and, um, and for a small scale uh, startup level. So, so that's kind of the, um, um, the work that we are conducting at the moment. Um, in, and also analyzing the current portfolio of the of the regional government um, and looking in the, at the interconnections with the different portfolios and what is emerging uh, what is emerging from the uh, from the deep listening uh, processes this in our opinion uh, this uh, uh, way of working that puts a lot of e effort in really understanding social and cultural dynamics and combining that with expert analysis and and data can, can give us um, um, a, a better infrastructure for uh, re responding to the, um, the challenges like COVID, for example, that uh, were not part of the, of the agenda and that can come uh, very rapidly 
in, 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 in unexpected forms. So we are not uh, expecting anymore that um, uh, expert analysis will tell us what is going to happen. What we want to do is to generate infrastructure, social, political, um, 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 public sector and private infrastructure that can generate um, uh, more innovative responses to the problems that are going to emerge and not so much on the, uh, on the specific topics that, uh, that might come. So, well, very happy to very happy to share uh, more information uh, in the future. But this is uh, just um, uh, what we wanted to uh, to present um, uh, for the conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Korka. Uh, thank you so much, Nick and John as well. Uh, I'm actually going to direct you to. There's a lot of questions and discussion in the chat, so maybe take a look of that. But I actually want to uh, give a chance again, a break from listening to our uh, groups, and I want to direct everybody into groups again with a particular question: uh, What is not yet possible for governments to try, but soon will be? What bold new experiments are coming? So really draw on the experience as well about this kind of structural uh, solutions that uh, Nick, John and Korka were talking about, but think about your own ways about uh, what is upcoming. Uh, Angela is going to share the Padlet link board and you're going to be directed into different groups as well. So you can actually meet as many uh, of your experts and practitioners in the field as possible throughout this session. So we'll give you 10 minutes again to quickly introduce yourself and please uh, go one by one and uh, uh, see what you think about the question and what might be possible. And in some ways as well, maybe at the OECD in different countries, maybe we can take some of these experiments into practice ourselves. Uh, uh, and maybe some countries in the mix will get inspired by this work. Uh, see you back in 10 minutes in the main room where we're going to hear about how to actually link anticipation to missions and how to do real work in practice. We'll hear after the session, we'll hear from Norway about these things. Uh, please uh, join the breakout rooms now. Hello, everybody back. Uh, as we have also, we have noticed that we have uh, really built into constraints of time constraints into this, uh, this session as well. So, you're hushed and hurried into new questions to answer, but that is really the reality of government as well, is that we have to do this anticipatory innovation work in the context of really sped up change as well. So how to balance the kind of the day-to-day -day and time management and time planning issues with the type of work that we actually want to do in government. And next also, how to line this type of work with um, kind of big goals, visions, new types of developments and missions in the government system as well. And this is something that we have really seen coming up both in the European Commission context and where after COVID-19 and the cascading uh, effects connected to it, we really have new types of challenges that we and goals that we need to uh, have fulfilled and we need to build up much better or in new ways uh, after this crisis or even during this crisis as well. But we also need to develop new types of missions and goals that are ambitious beyond kind of reacting to the crisis at hand. And I think I'm very happy to actually introduce uh, Kristen Hoxha who is doing this type of work in Norway uh, connected to also developing a seamless government uh, in uh, in uh, the context of the Norwegian go uh, government system. And it's what is excellent uh, connected to that is that usually digitalization tends to be in its own silo. We have different maturity levels of digital systems in our governments, and uh, we tend to also develop them, develop them based on a technological logic that we have these technological opportunities or digital solutions, or we are making current services into digital format. But what actually is possible and uh, possible out there? So how to kind of gear up the thinking and think about the possibilities connected to technological and especially digital change in government structures is a question for us as well. I hope that Kirsten can uh, address this in some way uh, as well. Kirsten is uh, responsible for cross-sectoral cooperation and works with innovation and digital transformation project uh, called Seamless Services and Life Events. She has extensive international experience within foresight and scenario planning, 
from international uh, consulting firms. And in addition to having completed a master's program in scenario development, foresight and strategy, she also holds the certificate from the Oxford Scenario Program at the University of Oxford. She is also our dear national contact point for the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation in Norway. So I'll give the floor over to you. Kristen, uh, you're on mute. Yes, I have been asked to share some reflections on the question, how to tie anticipation to missions? And I do not have the answer, but I will share how we try out new innovative methods and ways of working in developing seamless public services for seven prioritized life events in Norway. Let's start with the beginning. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, next slide again. Um, uh, um, now, one back, please. Yeah, let's start with the background. Norway has a well-functioning and efficient public sector. There are nevertheless major challenges. The digital strategy, one digital public sector, states that digitalization shall promote a more efficient public sector, more value creation in the business sector, and not the least, a simpler everyday life for most people. And one area of focus in the strategy is seamless services. And it states that public services shall be perceived as seamless and integrated by the users, regardless of which government agency provides them. And that's not the case today. And developing seamless services means both systemic innovation and digital transformation. And the strategy, in the strategy, the government hand has initially prioritized the development of seamless services for seven life events. And these are major events in a user's life where it's difficult to navigate the information and services in the public sector. And each of these life events has an appointed ministry that is responsible, the owner. But municipalities, county authorities and central government agencies need to collaborate in order to develop user-centric digital services. And Project Seamless Services in the Norwegian Digitalization Agency, where I have my work, supports the seven life events. We give advice and support to each of the seven life events. We are creating an ecosystem and arenas for cooperation and knowledge sharing, and we develop and test new methodology. Next, please. Yeah, next again. And what do we offer? One of our offerings is foresight or anticipatory innovation methodology and services. And this is a direct follow-up on a recent government white paper on innovation uh, that presents foresight as a methodology and skill that should be used to a greater extent by the public sector to, to promote innovation. Uh, click again. Next, yeah. And what do we offer? What we offer are tools and methods. Some of them are new, and some of them we have uh, uh, extensive experience. We have updated the driving force document describing the driving forces that will have an impact on the public sector towards 2030. And we also could run workshops and meetings. And we will do this to test and learn together with the five, seven live events. And we will tailor made and make everything suitable for each of the uh, live events and learn together with them. And next. And actually one of our live events have starting and managing a voluntary organization 
they are testing both the foresight anticipa anticipation and emissions approach. And they have just started their work, but I will share some reflections on how to tie anticipation to emissions. They are starting with establishing uh, an understanding of the voluntary sector. And at the same time, they explore the future. They make future scenarios. And by doing that and having a long view, it makes it easier to establish a mission on a more short, short term. And the next step for them will be the, uh, the needs today should meet the, the needs, nah, the needs uh, to tomorrow possibilities. And that could be helpful to understanding the future user needs and prioritize arena for development of new services. And when they have been prioritizing and decided will come what they should deliver, the transformation will start to the delivery phase and its new owners. Um, the life event is complex with a large number of stakeholders from public, voluntary and private sector. With different perspectives and many ongoing digitalization initiatives. They also have to deal with uncertainty both in the short term and in the long run. And we have some preliminary insights that we want to share. Uh, so far, the foresight helps to inform and give direction in the life event work. And the future stories or scenarios will probably help to align the different stakeholders and make it easier to agree upon a common mission. This is early days and we have to test and learn together with the live events and have more insight to share in the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm very intrigued as well as that uh, by doing this work on life events, it means that you also have to work across current government silos. Uh, how is that going? And, you know, sometimes we don't fit or the future doesn't fit into these kind of departments and organizations. What kind of tricks and tools could you share with us to actually do that work across different organizations with the minds of their own? Um, actually, we, we made uh, a scenario planning project in the white paper process. So I have all, uh, already experienced that scenario planning can help people have a kind of common platform and leave their perspectives behind and look into the future. And we had to we'll do the same thing here, perhaps mix the different sector representatives, both on the ministry level and also on the agency level, and let them talk about the future. What kind of driving forces could uh, influence this life event? What kind of scenarios may we see? What kind of questions are uncertain? And by doing that, uh, we have a common uh, perhaps perspective or a platform for selecting the right solutions, seeing the strategic blind spot, spots, so we are able to <laughs> be more future oriented and also solve and meet the future user needs. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you so much. And uh, is the government kind of used to working in this way? Because you know, governments are used to very much doing also, you know, roadmaps and very waterfall pro processes. They don't want to, you know, co-design, develop things because it's kind of non-committal, uh, you know, this anticipatory work because you have to iterate and the future, once you start acting, you of course change futures, future scenarios as well. Uh, how is this kind of, you know, flexible commitment and uh, how did you get it in Norway or are you getting it in Norway? It's early days and but I think uh, we have been giving a space and a room for experimentation and testing. So uh, the, the seamless services and seven life events program is a kind of innovation space where we try out new ways of working and new ways of cooperating and new ways of steering and new ways of 
anchoring processes and getting aligned about common missions. It's also a way of experimenting and moving towards different ways of working. So we had to, to make the space for innovation and experimentation. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm going to, as a final question, I'm going to draw from uh, also from our audience from an early questions that were posted on chat from Donna Dupont. Uh, technology is a big system driver of change with rapid innovation cycles from private sector and startups. How is government staying ahead of this from an anticipatory perspective to ensure digital ethics and public privacy moving into the future? So how are you taking digital ethics and public and like privacy into account in developing these solutions? Oh, that's a big question. Um, um, I think that the question of future trust it's a big question that we could take into account here. And also that, um, that the technology is moving very fast and perhaps we have to include or invite the technical startups and also private businesses and also the voluntary sector into uh, developing these seamless services. And by doing that also test and learn together. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you so much, Kristen, for this example. Uh, this time, actually, we're going to do it a little bit uh, differently, that we are going to have a little break because we need to clear our heads before actually the heavyweights come on board and tell us what they think about anticipation. So we have some great speakers from UNESCO, from the European Commission lined up to actually comment and react to this as well. But in the meantime, we're going to take a short five minute break to stretch our legs. And uh, also, uh, Angela is going to share you an individual exercise. So you're going to get a similar question on a Padlet board and you can add individually your points to that. So this time we're looking for individual uh, insights into the question of how to outline missions and how to kind of what could governments realistically aspire to, to to have and what new missions can governments take on for complex and uncertain futures and how anticipation can actually contribute to that so you have the question on the that part and this is an individual exercise so if you want to mention your name in the comment or add on to it then these two we will uh, probably get in touch if you have a specific challenge that you have in mind but otherwise uh, uh, contribute to that but also take a little bit of a you know a walk around get some sugar some energy because we have a great debate coming up with some great uh, insights and heavyweights from the world of anticipation from futures literacy to the anticipatory governance uh, topic at large we'll be back here in five minutes time
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. And now we have uh, the pleasure to also hear from uh, people who have been practicing in the space of anticipatory innovation and strategic foresight for quite some time. So I'm going to welcome for insights and reflections, Professor Leon Firth, Dr. Sheila Ranis, uh, Dr. Will Miller, and Dr. Fabiana Scopolo. We'll start with uh, Leon and Sheila regarding their insights. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Leon Firth, uh, who has a career in government spanning 30 years, including positions in the State Department, House and Senate staff, and the White House itself. Uh, his most recent government services has service was at the Vice President Gore's National Security Advisor for the eight years of the Clinton administration. After retiring from government the service at the conclusion of the Clinton administration, Professor Firth came to the George Washington University at the Elliott School of International Affairs. From 2018 to 2020, uh, he has served as a co-research of Project of Foresight and Democracy funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation and is currently co-directing the project of on civil leadership for the 21st century at the Ohio State University. And I'm also welcoming Dr. Sheila Aronis, uh, who is the president of the University Group Partnership, a management consulting firm and a think tank specializing in strategic management, visioning, leadership, national security and public policy. She is also an adjunct professor on management at the Walsh, Walsh, Walsh College, where she retired as a distinguished professor of management and director of the Center for Complex and Strategic Decisions. Uh, she is also teaching the capstone of the online masters in public affairs and leadership program for the Ohio State University. Uh, I welcome you both as part of the kind of the foresight community. Uh, I'll open the floor for kind of immediate marks and reactions to the today's discussion, and then we'll move on to the other speakers on the panel. Uh, over to you, uh, Leon and Sheila. Leon, you need to unmute yourself. I should also say that I got time off from the from the government for good behavior, but that's another problem. Um, Dr. Ronis and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to fill you in on, on the nature of the work we're now doing. Um, it really feels like we've come home. The similarities between your thoughts um, and, uh, and ours are very great and reassuring. Like we are motivated by the sense that events are moving so fast as to challenge the ability of democratic governments to respond uh, in a timely fashion. And like you, um, we think that it's necessary to start bringing to bear insights from systems analysis complexity theory, strategic foresight methods, together with factual expertise. Where um, we may be working on a slightly different path, uh, although I, I picked up um, indications that it's not novel to you folks at all, is our conviction that the public needs to be brought into this process. Um, in, in the United States, the reason for that is simply that uh, unless the public begins to produce signals to politicians that it wants to see um, a different kinds of policy making, um, there may be experiments, there may be efforts, there have been in the past, but in general they die out. Unless um, there is strong political support, usually from a president, uh, but the missing ingredient is public understanding um, and as things become more and more complex and fast moving, the absence of public understanding is going to be a major failure um, in our ability to come to grips with these issues in our, in our system. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is the effort that uh, Dr. Ronis and I are engaged on um, to develop methods for bringing the grassroots, the public and experts together but to think about the demands of the future, about how to meet those demands by means that are based on civil discourse, 
grounded on the facts instead of hyperpartisan politics that are based on irreconcilable ideologies. And Sheila, that brings us to where you are. Okay, so in 2016, Leon and I joined forces uh, in an effort to explore how by building upon his work on anticipatory governance funded by the MacArthur Foundation and my foresight work as a consultant to the De US Department of Defense, it would be possible to enhance civil discourse in the United States by buttressing it against the effects of hyperpartisanship, which of course is a huge issue in the United States. With that objective in mind, we developed a proposal that we called the Project on Foresight and Democracy, which thanks to the, a grant from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, we ran it from 2018 to 2020. And the project centered on a method that we termed the roundtable process. This process began with the assembly of an advisory panel of futures analysts, followed by the establishment of a panel of discussants a uh, diverse panel of discussants comprised of highly experienced individuals successful in many fields ranging from nuclear physics to military logistics. And with the help of the advisory panel, we identified a set of highly disruptive longer range trends, uh, generally at a 10 year time horizon, including advanced artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, totally immersive systems of social surveillance and control, extreme levels of climate change, and from the field of demographics, fundamental changes in the population profile of the United States. We, we also identified a small set of foresight techniques that could be used as an integral part of the process. So with the round table discussant, we began with exposure to basic analytic techniques, including insights from systems analysis, complexity theory, techniques of foresight analysis, principles of democratic governance, and our own work on pra practical applications of existing mechanisms in government. And we then used them to promote early recognition of major challenges and opportunity, whole of governance integration by way of networked operations and feedback in the form of continuous monitoring of results. And then having provided a new framework for analysis and discourse, we opened up discussions among the roundtable members focused on the interaction between rising forces detectable through foresight and their interactions with core values, some specific to the perspective of different components of the body politic and some comprising the core of our national identity. From the resulting discussions, we learned what ought to be, but seldom is a matter of common sense. If you try to tell people what they should think to the exclusion of all other possibilities, they're going to resist. But if you work with them on methods for thinking better, they'll respond by absorbing these ideas and then by applying them in new ways to the consideration of ongoing forms of deep, complex forms of change. And back to you, Leah. In January of this year, we moved on um, to the next stage of our work as an effort uh, to bring what we do and what we are proposed to do a step closer to the grassroots by way of a test of concept in a university setting, which we are now uh, doing under the auspices of the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at the Ohio State University, which is a major American research university with a student body in excess of about 60,000 students. If we succeed, the test of this concept is in the form of a new course, Foresight in American Democracy, uh, which is halfway through its first semester with encouraging results. We are introducing students to the roundtable process 
exposure to multiple systems of analysis, followed by expert briefings on long range trends, and these capped by roundtable style, uh, style discussions. And what we're looking for from them is a capacity to escape ideology and attain a more fluid view of the interactions of events in a democracy seen as a complex adaptive system. If we succeed at this, our next step, we hope, would be to repeat this process as a collaboration between the Glenn College and rising local leaders. And if we succeed at that, our ultimate goal is to encourage the development of a national network of such associations to support a conversation about the future of democratic values and systems of governance. And we think that this could be accomplished in a period of about four years on a modest budget, uh, God granting. Um, that's our objective. We think it's attainable. Um, it also brings me to the end of the prepared briefing that Sheila and I had, and we've agreed that I would like to add a final word at the opposite end of the scale of application. It's clear that the world as a whole needs concepts like anticipatory governance to be applied at the global level for the resolution of challenges that cannot be resolved by individual national governments or even by large regional groupings of such governments. The OECD uh, and this effort is a very hopeful uh, shift in that direction. The OECD is a tremendously influential center for the study of best practices and in, in innovation um, modeled on the Finnish initiative, which has begun as a matter of interest to one country and is now a matter of general interest to all. Because of its work at the leading edge, the OECD would be a logical point of origin for an initiative to apply the concept of anticipatory governance at the global level, which would be no small task, but the need is great because the circumstances of radical planetary importance for which existing concepts of governance require not just marginal renovation, but deep innovation um, are already upon us. Um, and I thought I would close by providing uh, a very basic example of how the decisions that we are making in our time are now capable of influencing uh, what people who won't live for another 10,000 years may experience. We are now, for example, still struggling with the problem of where to put radioactive waste. Um, no one has licked yet the problem of how you store materials that will have a half-life of 10,000 years or more under conditions where future generations will understand the danger and avoid it. And yet, um, the decisions about doing this will be made sooner or later, somehow, in our time. Now uh, we are debating where to get rid of carbon dioxide. Uh, and one of the emerging suggestions is to deposit it in um, underground uh, storage, uh, essentially uh, hoping that it will stay there over geological periods of time. But one thing geology tells us is that sooner or later what's deep underground uh, reaches the surface. Um, and so if we manage to bury gigantic quantities of carbon dioxide uh, in order to deal with problems of our generation, <clears throat> we are storing away potentially a huge problem for some future generation uh, far distant from our own. Point of these two examples being that decisions that are now urgent and contemporary um, are going to influence the future, not for a decade, but for a millennium or more. Uh, and that is a real test for the concept of foresight as applied to policy. Thanks. Thank you so much both for these insights indeed. Uh, it really feels like sometimes like you're the gardener of the future. It's one of these uh, 17th and 18th century uh, English gardens where the gardeners never saw their outcome of their woodland and gardens but had to imagine it for the future themselves so what it might look like. Uh, I'm going to bring in other panelists to talk 
about this futures literacy and I'm going to welcome Will Miller and Fabiana Scott about what they've heard in the session before, uh, before we go into questions and some great questions from the panelists. Uh, but now introducing Real Miller, uh, Dr. Real Miller, uh, for over 30 years, uh, he has been pioneering advances in the theory and practice of using future as a means to improve management and public policy uh, with the focus on transformational leadership. He has designed and implemented hundreds of projects worldwide using the future in order to change what people see and do. He is an uh, experienced and innovative educator, a pioneer of futures literacy and discipline of anticipation from uh, UNESCO. His unflagging ambition is to find ways to put the richness of complex emergence at the service of humanity's capacity to be free. And I'm also welcoming Dr. Fabiana Scopola, who with 15 years of ex uh, working experience on foresight in managing and applying foresight to specific contexts and topics. Uh, her main interests uh, include fostering application of foresight methods and tools in support of policymaking at the European Union level. She is the acting head of Unit of Foresight Modeling, Behavioral Insights and Design for Policy at the European Commission General Joint Research Centre in Brussels. The uh, unit also hosts the EU Policy Lab, a collaborative experimental space combining tools and practices that design for policy foresight, behavioral insights, and citizen engagement for innovative policy making in Europe. I'll give it over to maybe starting with Real for his comments, and then we'll go to Fabiana. Uh, is that okay? Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. we do. Um, well, very, very glad to be with you. And, and uh, I want to echo the uh, enthusiasm uh, that's been expressed on the importance of uh, this initiative and the work you're doing and, and the role that the OECD plays. So congratulations to, to all of you. Um, let me, let me uh, take off uh, from, from where Leon uh, uh, ended. Uh, we shouldn't have ever produced that waste. In other words, the, the issue here is the relationship that we have to the world around us. And I think Extinction Rebellion uh, has it right. Um, we've really got to, I mean, the, the system must end. And I put in the chat in a rather dramatic way, you know, improving slavery was just not a, a, a really uh, plausible proposition. Uh, you just had to end the system. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the bottom line on anticipatory systems thinking is that humanity has adopted fundamentally a preemptive uh, colonizing uh, superior position with respect to the world around us. And that is, of course, reflected in our governance systems, which are hierarchical, command and control. And I am convinced, uh, and have been convinced for a long time, that even the greatest and best improvements in those systems would not get us where we want to go. Uh, in other words, the, the, you know, the, uh, the proposition that's often referenced to indigenous uh, thought, which is think in terms of seven generations, is not an appeal to long-term thinking. It's an appeal to live now in a way which will not disturb the future. Uh, and it's therefore an ethical uh, and wisdom-based approach to relating to the world around us, uh, and one which respects the world around us and its differences. And I think that uh, the, the fundamental question today, which is a very difficult one, is what strategy to adopt to encourage a transition out of the current uh, world that we live in. Uh, and in that sense, I don't think we can fix Humpty Dumpty. Uh, if, if the uh, lament today is that um, fake news and the bastions of the previous uh, you know, systems of power for assuring people that this is the truth. Uh, perhaps the Pope at one time, uh, perhaps the Nobel Prize winner at another time, perhaps the charismatic leader at another time. That entire system uh, is, is fundamentally uh, untenable. Uh, it leads to climate extinction. Um, and so if we're going to stop reproducing the structural and systematic reproduction of oppression, we have to identify the way in which we're using the future as one of the main culprits. Our dominant and very powerful tendency to simply repeat what has happened in the past or improve upon what has happened in the past bakes in so many of the things that we consider objectionable. And then we act surprised that they still manage to survive despite our best intentions. 
So I, I don't want to sound, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, destructive or, or apocalyptic. But I really think that if we're going to take anticipatory governance seriously, we need to really reconcile it with complexity and a notion of assemblages, which are not hierarchical and which are not deterministic. And if we move into a, 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 both an ontological and epistemic perspective, which sees reflexivity and the role that we play in creating the world around us uh, as something to take seriously, then I think we, we can begin to build uh, different experiments towards something we don't know. In other words, I would claim that transformation is unknowable. Transition is doable. But of course, you can't know what a transformation is until it's happened. And by then, it's already happened. It's not because you knew it in advance and caused it to happen. So I, I just would make the appeal here um, to, really, to really stretch the limits uh, and also be modest in our, in our approach, in the sense that what we're doing at the current moment, and I would argue from the point of view of what UNESCO is doing, and those of you who participated in the Futures Literacy Summit, is we are beginning beginning to acquaint humanity with something that is very fundamental to biology and to the basic definition of life. Anticipation is part of what it means to be alive. It's a part of the definition of life. And in the same way that we understand why reading and writing are meaningful, because we all know how to use language, anticipation is something we can become much better at in its diversity. And we've had already a great demonstration in this session of the diverse ways in which we use anticipation. And I invite all of them to play a role. But I think it's crucial for us to have a disciplinary foundation, a theory of the future that underpins these activities. I'll stop there. Thank you, Will. And we also need the kind of the, really the call for action in terms of the transformation as well. So great on that point. We have some great questions from the audience exactly connecting to that before. But before I'm going to give the word over to Fabiana for her reflections, uh, dealing with the kind of the messy and the political world of the European Union and kind of the global perspective, or at least a regional international perspective to uh, foresight. I'll give the floor over to you for reflect reflections. Uh, thank you, Pirat, and thank you for this invitation and uh, uh, for all the great contribution I've uh, heard up to now. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking in, uh, uh, before starting my, my uh, comment here, whether I should really uh, tell you what uh, uh, the institution is doing. So the fact that uh, uh, since uh, the von der Leyen Commission, we are aiming to uh, mainstream strategic foresight uh, in the preparation of major policy initiative, or uh, whether I should be a, a bit more provocative and maybe um, not talk as, as, a, 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 as a civil servant working for the European Commission, but more as a, a person that has worked on, on, uh, uh, on, on foresight since, since a number of uh, years, and that uh, is now reflecting on uh, what uh, I have seen and, and, uh, and, what, um, and what we can do. And I, I'm thinking a bit of what Riel has, has, uh, was saying before, and my major concern is that uh, um, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, policymaking has to deal with a, a number of different issues. Some issues are, um, let's say, uh, more uh, um, simple and known and where you need to have a more, uh, um, let's call it product service approach. And uh, some other are more complicated and, and familiar. And here uh, you need to have uh, uh, you know, uh, a way to deal with this uh, uh, issue uh, with uh, maybe some uh, technical uh, uh, knowledge and uh, understanding the system and then try, try to see how a specific system can be improved. And then we have the very complex and ambiguous uh, uh, challenges and, and, uh, and uh, problems. And here I bring something as an example. We are working in, in, uh, in the policy lab on uh, 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 contributing to the farm to fork uh, strategy. And here I wonder whether as a, uh, as institution or uh, we have the right institution, we have the right policy making processes uh, to think ahead 
uh, and to tackle these challenges because uh, uh, a, a problem like the farm to fork strategies uh, might require it, it's requiring to think at it uh, uh, with a new uh, econo as a new economic concept uh, and it requires to deal with it in a completely uh, different way and what we are doing we are doing just uh, the same we have then to produce a, um, a policy document which is a uh, you know a document which for, in my view this is where the mistake is and, and where even foresight uh, with all the good uh, uh, you know willing that we might have um, can play a role but uh, if we don't reflect on how to change uh, uh, the way we do policy making to first uh, asking ourselves uh, do we understand conceptually what the challenges that uh, we have in front of us are and are we able to frame uh, this challenge in the correct way so that uh, uh, we can deal with them not only for uh, as a you know for the long term and um, so this is this is a bit where my reflection is at the moment and of course here uh, what it is important to, to to do in my view is to come up uh, with uh, um, multidisciplinary approaches uh, uh, that include uh, people coming from very different uh, uh, background like designer ethnography uh, people that know about policy maker but to really try to uh, co-create policy and to involve stakeholders uh, from the moment uh, of uh, the framing of the issue. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, this is my reflection. If you also want to know uh, all the good uh, things that uh, we are trying to do at the level of the Commission in terms of uh, embedding foresight in policy making, yes, we, we are doing it. Uh, we are uh, trying to uh, focus also on uh, how we can uh, uh, ensure that uh, short-term action are grounded in long-term ob objective and that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that Europe uh, is, in, uh, uh, is leading in the way in charting its own uh, course and shaping the world around it. We are talking about uh, the uh, twinning of the green and digital transition, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, we are still uh, addressing the issue very much in a, a traditional way and not uh, to uh, foster what are the added value also of using strategic foresight in a way that shapes uh, how uh, policy making is, is done uh, uh, at any level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabiana. So many great points there as well. Something that we also struggle at the OECD to understand that report is not really the future. I have, there of course have been some fantastic books in history as well that have been kind of setting a new narrative and identity or a vision for the future. But uh, I have to say, uh, I don't even want to do the analysis of how many OECD reports uh, do that in practice. So we need more uh, maybe non-traditional tools to actually build an anticipatory innovation capacity in our member countries as well. But now I really want to go to the questions and great questions from our audience that have been coming in. And, and I'm going to uh, point out to something that uh, also Beal and uh, the others have been uh, talking about that from a question from Mikael Edelstrom, who is asking that anticipatory innovation as a tool for preparing for incremental change is easy to understand. But how about paradigm shifts? Harder to anticipate what they might look may look like, harder to motivate budgeting uh, and so forth. Would be very interesting to hear you elaborate on this and we can anticipate hope for at least some paradigm shifts in the future or anticipation of those paradigm shifts. Um, maybe we can start by Sheila uh, and this uh, time and then take it forward to whoever in the panel wants to jump in. I, I really, believe in the concepts of systems and complexity. And the more that you understand those concepts, the more likely we have positive outcomes at the end. Um, complexity tells you that you really cannot control anything and that there is 
uh, a great, but, but that doesn't mean you can't influence things. And so I think it's really important that when people uh, try to go from one state to another state, they actually do try to think about what the system needs to look like. And um, I have no problem with saying that the system we're in is just gone or unusable or uh, not even viable. And that it is time to completely rethink what kind of a system is gonna support the future that you want. And um, I think that that's absolutely critical in all of the work we do in anticipation. It, it's, uh, it's important to be able to understand those systemically with the filter of com complexity science. My two cents. Very good. Leah and I can see your hand up, but you need to jump in. Yeah. Um, one of the good things about this partnership between Sheila and me is that we um, have contrasting styles. Uh, I understood your question to have to do with um, uh, paradigm shifts. Yes. And my immediate response as I listened to the question was that um, to some extent, you can um, approach that question incrementally. Um, but I believe that you actually need to find individuals who by nature have a tendency to think well beyond the normal uh, confines of what uh, is considered to be advanced thinking of the day. And you need to give them the opportunity um, to think those thoughts and express them under conditions that protect them from the resistance and possible um, punitive instincts of existing organizations and persons in power. Um, because their inspirations will range from ridiculous but ultimately true. Um, they, are, they are a place where Ordinary people like me would turn to look for a batch of new thinking uh, to work with. Um, when teaching students about foresight, um, I used to tell them that if they wanted to start imagining what was going to happen in the more distant future, um, I'd recommend that they start reading science fiction because there is a funny sort of way in which good science fiction foreshadows what eventually happens. Um, and so if you want imagination, go to where the imagination is earning somebody a living. Um, and that's one of the places where uh, the hunting is the hunting is good. Um, the only other thing I want to add is um, she and I ask our students to submit short essays uh, at weekly intervals. Um, and I was looking at one this morning. And here's what the student said. He said, like the steam engine or the atomic bomb, advanced artificial intelligence will represent an inflection point in human history. A quote, an event horizon of a mysterious black hole where once the threshold is crossed, there is absolutely no turning back. Um, there's a student who is probably in his early, in his early 20s, uh, who has just jumped the fence um, and he's talking about um, something which is happening now, but accelerating at such a rate as to produce completely discontinuous effects. And so if you're trying to imagine a new paradigm, you could do worse, but then to try to imagine what happens when um, advanced intelligence becomes self-teaching and able to write its own programming and ask its own questions and reach its own conclusions by means that none of us understand. That is within a 10 year horizon, probably. Okay, but what it opens up is a total challenge to the present organization of society and economics as it systematically displaces hundreds of millions of people 
from various forms of occupation and raises profound questions about the division of property, um, the nature of, of leisure, the nature of work, the nature of what it means to be a human being when one after the other, the accomplishments of humanity um, essentially become overtaken by the capabilities of machines. So um, I guess that's a long answer to the question of where do you look for paradigm shifts? And that is uh, not incrementally, but go to the people who are making jumps and then come back and start thinking uh, incrementally as Sheila and I are, are wont to do by applying systems analysis and complexity theory. Excellent. I hope the student got an A because that's an A plus answer in my book for sure. Uh, maybe also- Maybe even better, um, just a compliment in writing. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, I'm going to also maybe pointing to Real and Fabiana. Do you think that the governments that you're working together with or the big organizations that you're working in actually understand and appreciate or think about those big paradigmatic shifts in planning policy or thinking about uh, new types of policies or their own actions? Does that happen at the moment? Real, maybe we'll go to you first and then to Fabiana. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've thought about this question for, for uh, actually a very long time um, because it was something that, that, that occurred to me when I started at the OECD in 1982 um, about what, what governments could actually do um, or were willing to do or able to do. Um, and back then in 82, 83, we were actually writing on the role of, of the state in, uh, in, uh, in fun fundamentally capitalist societies. Um, I would say that it's the it's the basic issue that you raised there is one of the the strategic uh, uh, posture of those in power, those in power who have the the you know therefore because they have that power can plan and want to impose uh, can take a position which is um, any any new thing that potentially threatens my dominance is a danger that must be destroyed. Um, there's the other option, which is benign neglect, simply not paying any attention. And the other is to say, look, birth and death is something that's completely good for the for 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 a, a universe that's that's based on create the creative emergence uh, and evolutionary processes. And therefore, we should think about our death, and we should be generous enough to gift our death. That we should end. Firms should end. Governments should end nation states should end because they if they live forever they're simply you know saying well the dinosaurs we just don't want to get out of the way uh and today for i think many many reasons the institutions that we work for are zombies they're living dead uh that doesn't mean that they can't be good compost they can create create good fertilizer for some future i don't know what that future is but currently the posture is really one of uh, immortality and that's also true, uh, I think, of, of many cultures and societies. Immortality is the way for us to beat nature. Look at how successful I am. Uh, and this pr way of thinking about status, hierarchy, success um, is fatal. I think fatal for the species. So uh, when it comes to paradigmatic change, I think it happens without us thinking about it. Uh, in other words, it's an emergent property of the universe we live in. And we don't have to worry about it. What we need to worry about is whether or not we can act ethically in the present. And if we can't act ethically in the present, then we need to make changes. We don't know if those changes will create a transformation or not, but they are simply the expression of our karma, our, our ethics uh, as, a, as a gift to tomorrow. Uh, and that to me is, is, is a, a position which really embraces paradigmatic change in its fundamental way of functioning. It's not about guessing the next whatever. That's a planning perspective. That's a power perspective. That's a prescient perspective. That's an ideological perspective. And I think we all know where ideology has gotten us uh, in the 20th century and where climate change is going to get us in the 21st. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Rila, I hope your next book is going to be titled Government Karma, because I will definitely be buying that and reading that with great interest. <laughs> Fabiana, over to you. I hope the European Union and, and the governments you're working together with are, are better at this and not living zombies yet, or maybe just a life support and uh, wa waiting to be kind of mutated into something else. 
What do you think? Ah, it's, it's a very, very difficult question. Uh, um, I think that uh, there is an understanding uh, that uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, changes and paradigm shift is necessary. But I go back to what uh, uh, also Riel was saying and what I was saying before. I am not sure uh, whether, um, in a sense, we are ready to take the risk uh, or to get out of the comfort zone uh, that our institution are in um, to, to embrace and go for this uh, uh, paradigm uh, shift uh, that it's necessary. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy, uh, not an easy uh, question. And uh, maybe uh, the fact that uh, uh, we are, um, we have this risk uh, mentality also, uh, you know, uh, everything is about risk assessment and, and so on. I think in a sense uh, kills also uh, innovation. And uh, so as I was saying before, I think we need to reflect very carefully on whether we uh, understand well what the challenges are and uh, if we are able to frame them in, in the right way, way so that we can move on uh, in a different, on a different path. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think this is excellent too, Fabiana. It says as well something very practical. We meet in governments that every, everything is translated into risks and probabilities. But what actually behavioral science tells us is human beings are horrible with probabilities and actually making decisions based on those. So it's kind of a you know, double blind spot that we want to make something into something that makes us feel more secure, but then are unable to actually use them in practice. I see hands up uh, that people want to jump in, but I actually want to get really, really practical now as we are uh, conscious of time. So I'm going to go for another question from Ilias uh, Castritis. Uh, and I want very concrete answers from you, like two, three key points. Uh, could you name one or two key levers for from your own experience that could jumpstart the community of network formation and key policies, bearing in mind that policy making and making does not exist in a vacuum. Investments decisions are being made, projects create impacts and stories chain narratives in a perpetual disruption environment. But how do we actually key, uh, like kickstart this? a huge network in, uh, in the UNESCO levers from your experience to actually kick this, this change process and also create a community around them if people want to kind of embark on this journey. We'll, we'll start with you this time. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, Pirat, but uh, part of your question really? was not, uh, uh, the, the, the voice was uh, not uh, stable. Okay, so uh, the question was, could you name a one to two key levers from your experiments that could jumpstart the community around strategic foresight or anticipatory innovation with concrete actions on the ground? Uh, did it now carry over? I think your connection is now okay, um, if, you, if you don't mind repeating your question again. Okay, so uh, the key levers, uh, one sentence only about what is the one or two sentences, what are the key levers of your own experience to start uh, jumpstart these processes in government? Like what have you learned about, like what is the lever that kind of moves the mountain for anticipation and anticipatory innovation? Yeah, real. Okay, I, I would just say permission to empower the people who are actually dealing with the problem. <laughs> permission to empower the people who are actually dealing with the problem. Uh, and that empowerment does include them being able to use the future to envision their own future and therefore they become sovereign, capable of 
dealing with their own hopes and their own fears, which deals with the motivation and the kinds of solutions that they come up to because that they develop because they become the ones who define their own problems rather than somebody else defining their problems. Over to you. Can I jump in? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, sorry, uh, because it, the, the sound is really not uh, stable. Uh, yeah, for me, are three things, collaboration, co-creation, and co-design. Next, can I, yes. can I go next? Um, I, I think that it's, it's humility with an understanding that you don't have the answers and a, a, a willingness in a world where leaders are expected to have the answer to say, we don't know the answer and we really have to get there together uh, with an open mind. Mm -hmm. And Liam. Hmm? Uh, over to you. Me? Yes. I guess. Um, let me just be sure I'm on. Someone was talking about um, the, um, the need to to give over gracefully to the come to the future. Um, on a personal note, I'm 82 and I think about mortality a lot. Um, uh, and in the process of thinking about mortality, um, I think a lot about um, the very concrete specifics of taking care of my own family as a first priority. And the reason I'm raising this is everything dies, empires die. Um, and we can talk in an abstract way about how good it is um, um, to basically go with the flow um, and, and leave not only when your time is up, but maybe even ahead of time to make room for the future. But we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of people and what happens to them while these transitions are underway. And we're also talking about a world in which there are a number of states uh, that possess enough nuclear power, firepower to end the entire show. And that firepower is ready to go. Um, and in the course of the kinds of tensions and disruptions that would occur in a kind of freestyle abandonment of what is uh, and leap into the unknown those are those are fuses that lead to um, war and any war in the future um, is linked to a series of one or two moves to a nuclear denouement. So um, my caution is uh, that while one must accept the end of things, um, the proper function of governance is to try to manage those things um, for the future thinking of the people of the future um, as, as persons for whom care must be taken. One does not simply depend upon history to make things turn out for them. Um, it's a revolutionary principle that destruction is a creative principle, but the destruction involves humans. So the question is, what is to be done uh, about them, and in particular in democracies, um, how are the people themselves to be brought along um, into the transitions that are essential? Thank you so much. And thank you all on the panel for your great, great insights. Uh, it has been unbelievably quick uh, last three hours. And uh, we are certainly at the OECD going to continue with uh, this work. And what is going to come up next, I'm going to actually give it over to Josh Bolshar, who is our lead in strategic foresight, and he's going to say what they're going, what is going to happen with all of this.
Thank you so much, Pirette. And uh, what an act to follow hearing all these reflections. And I was really struck by what Sheila said when she said humility, because actually, personally, that means an awful lot to me. And it's, it's what I'm in this for. Uh, and legitimacy as well, because I think uh, legitimacy depends on humility to a large extent. We're kind of all blind, like the blind people feeling the elephant and jumping to conclusions about what part of the future we're grabbing onto. And in strategic foresight, we try to have humility about that and not to run for that temptation to have big solutions and panaceas and nail down the future into a report, uh, referencing what Fabiana and Pirette both said, you know, the future is not a report and uh, we can't uh, summarize it in uh, pages like that. Um, and it's worth having humility to admit that we don't have a complete sense of future and we never will do because the future isn't here yet, but we still have to act and try to succeed today. And that's what we're doing in OPSI. So there's my transition. We're working with the governments of uh, Slovenia to put together a set of scenarios uh, reflecting on the future of the public service, particularly focusing on public service talent management. Those scenarios are still too early for us to share with uh, this event, but if participants are able to join us tomorrow morning, you'll be able to hear a bit more about that. You heard from our colleagues in Finland about the work that we're doing with them, trying to understand their anticipatory system and uh, develop a blueprint for how to build on that further and really embed anticipation in the very functioning of government. And you also heard about our collaboration with Ireland, uh, doing much the same thing, uh, but with some different starting points and looking at uh, some of the most essential system elements to build foresight capacity throughout the national uh, public service and beyond. I think I've uh, said everything at the top of my mind. If I've forgotten anything, then uh, I invite my colleagues to chip in. Otherwise, I hand back over to Pirette. Thank you so much. We are also working in Latvia, in, uh, in the Basque country, in Sweden, uh, in a lot of different countries at the same time, all in the advancement of anticipatory innovation governance and also the government missions connected to that. So we have a team of missions for working hard as well to kind of not get governments locked in, but actually on the roads of those transitions. Thank you all for your engagement. Uh, great gratitude to all the speakers who have come in and shared their experience openly and with such elegance and insight. I also hope that uh, a lot of you will be able to join us tomorrow on the sessions on the future of public sector and on the, also on the session on tools and methods for anticipatory uh, innovation uh, itself. Thank you all and hope to see you again soon. And I hope this is also one of the levers for an international community on anticipatory innovation. Uh, where we can tie in all the insights uh, coming from futures literacy and elsewhere into the practice of the future in action today uh, in governments with an ethical and uh, with a karma approach of governments with the footprint to follow. Thank you all and hope to see you again soon. <laughs>